I'm late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing Mason Tavert. He is from the Marijuana Policy Project. And, um, well, first of all, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, thanks. Thanks for having me. Good deal. Happy to have you here. So, it's funny. I had read about you years ago, and I was telling my friend about it the other day. Like, yeah, there was once this guy who did this and that, which we're going to talk about. And uh, then it occurred to me that, huh, I guess at the time, I forgot to remember that I have a radio show, and I could have interviewed you back then. Um, but when I was telling the story, I thought, oh, I had to get this guy on the show. So that's this. Um, and that is that you had, uh, a, I guess, a few great ideas in a row to help agitate to get pot legalized in Colorado. Uh, very effective ones. Um, and that make great anecdotes for retelling and that kind of thing. So I was wondering if uh, we could start off with you talking a little bit about that. Sure. Well, you know, for several years in Colorado, uh, really starting in 2005, but we engaged in a, a very new type of public education campaign to build support toward legalization, which ultimately was uh, successful in 2012. And that was through an organization called Safer, uh, Safer Alternative for Enjoyable Recreation, which really was based on the theory that if we would increase the percentage of the public that understood the fact that marijuana is safer than alcohol, then we would see support for making it legal and treating it like alcohol grow. And that's exactly what happened. And with a limited budget, we did that through a variety of publicity stunts and earned media efforts uh, that really were geared toward forcing people to think about the fact that marijuana is less harmful than alcohol. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, first thing there is you chose to completely change the frame of the argument from whatever it was before that hippies like pot. So please legalize it or whatever kind of message was getting through to something else. And then from that point on, I mean, you're correct. Obviously I agree with you, but it's almost beside the point you controlled the narrative. And they're all reacting to you at that point, basically. Yeah, I mean, for for the large part, most efforts to end marijuana prohibition or argue for broader legalization, broader than medical, uh, were based on the harms of prohibition and this notion that, you know, prohibition is worse than marijuana. You know, marijuana may not be good, but prohibition is worse and there's all these harms and, you know, conversations about generating tax revenue and saving law enforcement resources and taking marijuana out of the underground market. And those are all obviously very good arguments. But if you're talking to a population that largely believes marijuana is just as dangerous as heroin, then talking about tax revenue or the benefits of it being sold in stores instead of the underground market is, is hardly going to win people over. They need to first understand what we're talking about, which is a substance that is objectively less harmful than one that is legal and that most Americans consume. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell me, what's a drug duel? Well, in, you know, back in 2006, uh, we were trying to, to highlight this, this fact of marijuana being less harmful than alcohol. And at the time, the mayor of Denver, John Hickenlooper, now our governor here in Colorado, uh, was, was opposed to a ballot measure we had to make marijuana legal. And so we challenged him to a duel uh, in which he would drink beer from the brew pub he owned at the time 
and I offered to use marijuana and we would see who could last longer to determine which substance was the more harmful. And, you know, obviously he did not show up, uh, but the message was clear that this was, you know, uh, clearly if he was to start drinking and, and someone were to start smoking some joints, um, the person drinking would obviously not last as long. And, um, you know, it, this was a good example of uh, a media stunt where we had uh, some editorials that said it was juvenile and silly and so on, but they also went on to say it made a valid point. And that was the goal, was to get that point across. Mm -hmm. And then I read that you challenged at that time a Senate candidate from the Coors family, and then that raised the question I got to ask was, did you particularly bust on him to like, you can drink Coors Light and kind of make fun of him in that way, and he still didn't show, or how'd that work? We actually, we actually, you know, yeah, it was it was Hick and Looper, and we actually it was him and Pete Coors who uh, had previously run as a Republican for Senate in Colorado, and really the reason was that we were trying to avoid the appearance of any sort of partisan. You know, we're only picking on a Democrat, and so the idea was well. You know, this Democratic elected official owns a brew pub and this Republican political figure own, you know, is involved in the Coors empire. Uh, let's, you know, call on them to to do this. And, uh, you know, needless to say, neither of them happen to be around in, or in town of that day. Mm -hmm. All right. So obviously this is the big point that. This made the breakthrough then through what local news coverage and I know talk radio is a big deal in Denver and what have you. But what so they just decided that, yeah, they're right. This guy's right. Let's go ahead. It's if it's not worse than alcohol, then what are we doing? And night and day took place. What's the deal with that? I mean, you know, I know there was more to your argument than that, but that seems like that's really the big. This was the key to it, huh? Yeah, I think, uh, you know. 50 years from now, when you look back, that's how simple it will look. Uh, obviously, it was a much longer and more involved process, but essentially that's correct. I mean, uh, we spent about seven years just hammering this message over and over through various publicity stunts, ballot initiative campaigns, uh, standard, you know, grassroots organizing and public advocacy, you know, education. Um, we just constantly hammered on this message that marijuana is less harmful than alcohol and, and conveying it in different ways and uh, getting those facts out there over a period of time. And during that period of time, we saw, we saw people's opposition start to break down. Uh, those who were the most heavily opposed, or at least who are somewhat opposed, maybe started being less opposed or neutral. And uh, we started seeing support grow significantly. And really it was just a matter of, of addressing the perception of harm so that when voters were asked, should marijuana be legal rather than worrying that this could result in all sorts of mayhem, they would say, well, it is less harmful than alcohol. What could go, what, what could, what could go wrong? And uh, that's essentially what happened. And, and we ended up breaking through and, and passing amendment 64 in 2012. Mm. Well, you're certainly right about the way certain segments and I guess large ones conceive this issue. And, uh, you know, I had a conversation with a guy, it was about cocaine, but it was basically the same difference where his attitude was cocaine kills people. It kills people. And so therefore, if you use cocaine, you should go to prison for about 15 years. If you have any at all. And if you do it again, they should cut your head off. You should just be taken out and shot. And then that'll teach you. And that'll finally get people to stop using it. You know, because it's dangerous. So, but anyway, but the idea being that this is just intolerable, right? And that's the, the first premise is that this is to use cocaine itself is as bad as killing someone. And so we, there's no choice but to have this insane zero tolerance policy. And then I guess people think that pot maybe is a little bit less worse than that, but basically they lump them together because they're the illegal ones. And why would they be illegal if there wasn't a good reason for it? You know, and that's the kind of backwards thinking that people take. Uh, we hear that all the time. It's wrong because it's illegal and it's illegal because it's wrong. The classic case of begging the question in the actual sense of that term that people use wrongly all the time. Absolutely. You know, we, we would hear that 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 type of argument or that circular logic uh, frequently. Um, this notion that marijuana is bad because it's illegal 
and therefore cannot be made legal. And, you know, I think that uh, over time, people are just starting to recognize that this is silly. And it's also, uh, you know, the second factor that I think played a major role in Colorado, there was the, you know, messaging of marijuana being less harmful than alcohol. And that public education was was one key factor. I think another one was the uh, establishment of a regulated system of medical marijuana uh, uh, sales and, and production, which really, you know, demonstrated that this was possible and realistic, that you could have a system where where marijuana is regulated and there can be stores and it can be sold and it can be subject to taxes and it's not going to immediately be shut down by the federal government. Uh, once people started to see that and, and, you know, then it became more of a realistic concept that, okay, this doesn't have to be an illegal substance. There is another option. And I think that played a big part in it too. Mm hmm. Well, in one of the articles I read, it said that part of your campaign was saying that this wastes police resources and that I guess if you pick and choose among them, you'll find plenty of cops who will tell you that they would rather be, you know, solving a crime or preventing one or something rather than this enforcing contraband rules. Without a doubt, um, you know, law enforcement officials have to decide what they're going to spend their time on. They do it every day. They see someone drive past them going eight miles, 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, and they don't necessarily pull them over because they don't think it's worth their time. Um, if they find a 25 year old with a gram of marijuana, that should be viewed in a similar situation. You know, why is that worth their time? Um, you know, they should be able to use their discretion to decide, Hey, this isn't worth the time. Let's focus on something else. Fortunately, now here in Colorado, we have laws that make it legal for uh, an adult of age to possess marijuana, but even in States where it's not legal, um, you know, we do, you, you often hear stories of police that confiscate beer from underage kids, but don't actually issue citations that happens mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and this was part of your argument in Colorado was to, police and pro police forces in the government and in politics there. Is that was, right? Yeah, we made it. It was more of the case that we made, uh, toward the end, uh, or leading up to the, the legalization initiative election in 2012, because as I said, you know, we first had to address people's perception of harm. You know, if you just say it's not worth police's time, but all the people in town, and all the elected officials think that marijuana is this deadly, dangerous substance, then they will think it's worth the police's time. You know, you first need to make sure people understand we're talking about something that's far less harmful than alcohol, has never resulted in an overdose death, uh, that doesn't contribute to violent behavior or, or things of this nature. Um, so therefore, it's not worth law enforcement's time. They should prioritize other things. And that is something that that voters here came to agree with mm -hmm. uh, after being you know educated about marijuana itself all right you guys here's how to support the show first of all subscribe to the rss feeds itunes stitcher and all of that uh, all the feeds are available at scotthorton.org and also at libertarianinstitute.org you can also follow me on youtube.com slash scott horton show and sign up for Patreon. If you do, anybody who signs up for a dollar per interview gets two free books from Listen and Think Audio. And uh, also, you'll get keys to the new Reddit page, reddit.com slash Scott Horton Show. And then if you go to scotthorton.org slash donate, 20 bucks will get you the audiobook of Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. 50 bucks will get you a signed copy of the paperback there. And a $100 donation will get you either a QR code, commodity disc, or a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think Libertarian audiobooks. That's all at scotthorton.org slash donate. And uh, also anybody donating uh, $5 or more per month there, if you already are or if you sign up now, you'll get keys to that new Reddit group as well. Already got about 50 people in there, and it's turning out pretty good. Again, that's reddit.com slash Scott Horton Show. If you're already donating or you're a new donor, just email me, scott at scotthorton.org, and I'll get you the keys there. And hey, 
Do me a favor. Give me a good review on iTunes or Stitcher, or if you liked the book on Amazon.com, and the audiobook is also on iTunes, and I uh, sure would appreciate that. And listen, if you want to submit articles to the Libertarian Institute, uh, please do, and they don't have to be about foreign policy. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. Well, I like this quote. It's from, I guess, one of your bosses at the Marijuana Policy Project, where he says... Mason is actually willing to stand up to power, but to do it responsibly and respectably, but not necessarily respectfully. And <laughs> I like that. That's a good approach. You don't want to, you don't want to uh, cede to them uh, too much honor uh, that they haven't necessarily earned, but uh, respectably, in you know, on your own uh, behalf is you know definitely that's a great way to go about it. I, I could probably uh, take a lesson in that. Um, but so, will you move to Texas, please? Huh. You know, I, I've done work in Texas uh, through MPP. We, we've been working uh, the past decriminalization measures, medical marijuana measures. Um, I'm actually now working uh, with uh, an entity called the American Hemp Campaign on some hemp legislation uh, in Texas or, or an effort to bring about hemp legislation. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's something that really... It, it, it. I think I have an idea for the campaign. 3,000 deaths a year on Texas roads. Figure out, you know, more or less the percentage of those that are drunk driving and bring that out. And you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people dead because they were hit by somebody who was drunk instead of high, which would have made the difference. Because, you know, like Bill Hicks said, if you get in a wreck, you're high. What? You're still only going five miles an hour. Bump. <laughs> you know, no problem. You know, I, I think that uh, the better figure would just be to point to the number of deaths associated with alcohol use alone. I mean, we don't really, you know, want to see people driving impaired by any substance, whether it's alcohol, whether it's marijuana. Right, well, how about if they were stoned, they would have stayed home? Well, <laughs> you know, something. Exactly, exactly. Because you know what? That figure, 3,000 something, that does represent alcohol, you know, in, a, in some large measure. And those are the most, you know, the, sometimes a car wreck just comes out of nowhere and there's just nothing you can do. The guy's brakes went out and, and, you know, whatever, some kind of thing. But sometimes it's really a careless mistake, like drinking too much before driving and putting someone else in danger totally unreasonably, you know. I, I don't disagree with you, but I mean, the fact remains that, that, you know, people shouldn't be driving while they're impaired by anything. And it's really just a matter of law enforcement focusing their time on people driving impaired rather than people sitting stone. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I hear you. Anyway, I'm no good. You do the gimmicks. I'll just be right about everything. But I mean, but this is part of the story in Colorado, right? Is that drunk driving accidents have gone way down since they legalized pot there, right? I mean, I uh, guess maybe you could you could correlate that with Uber and Lyft, too. I don't know. No, nah, well, it's actually not accurate, but we've also seen a significant increase in, in the population of the state over the last uh, five years. Well, so, yeah, you got to account for per capita. But so what happens well, when you do? We've also seen an increase in, in, in trap fatalities nationwide. And a lot of it, you know, the stuff gets attributed to uh, is economic. Uh, we've seen the ec economy rebound, which means that uh, gas is more affordable. Cars are more affordable. There's more miles being driven by more people. Um, so as a result, it's likely that there's going to be more accidents. Um, but you know, we're not seeing any evidence that, uh, there's been any sort of major increase in, in marijuana related deaths. In fact, the Colorado uh, department of transportation just came out and, and said that there appears to have been a, a decrease this past year in the number of fatalities involving a driver impaired by marijuana. Mm hmm well, so what other uh, effects has it had on, well, not just the pot markets, but, you know, society at large in Colorado since the legalization of recreational pot there? Well, you know, I think there's been very clear economic benefits. Um, we've we've certainly seen, you know, hundreds of businesses getting started, thousands of people being employed by those businesses, and they're all utilizing various services 
uh, of other local businesses and industries. You know, they all need, uh, you know, construction. They all need security. They all need to be buying, uh, you know, growing equipment and supplies and, and fertilizer and so on. So, you know, it, it really is just another new industry that is generating a lot of economic activity. Uh, but I think the most important thing that has occurred is that we're now seeing, you know, billions of dollars in marijuana sales over the last several years that have taken place inside licensed businesses instead of uh, in the underground market. And that means that people are able to purchase these products safely and legally. They know what they're getting. The products are tested, they're labeled, they're packaged properly, and they're not, uh, and, and, and there's taxes being paid on them. And obviously the state has generated hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes uh, that are being used for everything from uh, public school construction to uh, addressing homelessness issues to building uh, new municipal buildings or, or repaving roads. It, it really has gone a long way. Uh, but overall, what's that sounds like the gray cloud and this silver lining there more more money for government. But I understand that's a good selling point, though. Well, I mean, the fact remains that that, you know, you, you, you could have a, a, a much obviously broader conversation about the concept of government. But um, there were schools that were not able to house children because they were falling apart and now yeah, they're no i i hear you all other things being equal anyway is what we're talking about here that couldn't drive on roads that they can now because they've been paved I, I mean i think that those are pretty basic things that are benefits um you know so it, but by and large if you live here over the last six years since this law has been passed and gone into effect you don't really notice much difference um other than instead of seeing liquor stores Every now and again on the side of the road, you see an occasional marijuana store. But if you choose not to go in or what have you, I mean, life is no different. Uh, things are just as they have been for forever. Yeah. Well, you know, I read an article where um, the police in Colorado Springs were complaining that it's been a complete disaster for them. But then when you read the article, their complaint ultimately, although it's not the way they phrase it, of course, is that pot is still illegal in nearby states. And so, and it's still illegal to sell in Colorado without going through all the taxing and licensing and all the things that you're talking about. There's still, you know, therefore the government has left a huge part of the market still open for black market production. And so now that has actually increased because under the cover of growing pot legally, there are, you know, whole parts of the harvest are meant for the black market too, you know, under their accusations of some dealers, whatever it is, whatever percent. And so now having, you know, only gone halfway in a sense, uh, they found that they still have a crisis on their hands and one that's much worse, much harder to enforce against a higher volume of illegal pot now being grown in the legal pot state. Yeah. I don't really know if I buy the claim that there's more illegal growing taking place. Um, you know, obviously, they are now focusing their time and attention on those types of things. Uh, but, you know, the fact is that there were, you know, a billion dollars in marijuana sales um, that took place in a licensed market. And those sales all took place in the illegal market before. And the idea that we've taken a billion dollars in marijuana sales out of the illegal market and there's more illegal activity than before, I think is completely ludicrous. Um, you know, these are, are law enforcement officials with virtually no data. They like to use anecdotal evidence and, um, generally there, there's no way to actually, you know, prove that that's occurred, uh, because we are seeing far more marijuana activity taking place in the legal market now instead of the illegal market. I mean, every, you know, every marijuana plant being grown 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago, unless it was for one of the, you know, few thousand medical marijuana patients in the state of the time was illegal. And now we've got a billion dollars in marijuana sales that, that are legal. So the idea that we are still like, there's billions of dollars in marijuana being grown and, and distributed illegally. I just don't buy it. 
Yeah. And by the way, so uh, what has this meant for the persecution of regular people and usually the, the usual suspects, the poorer and darker skinned people at the hands of the cops over pot? Because so often, of course, it serves as a pretext for a further search and what else is in your pocket and blah, blah, blah. I think I smelled something. So has that really changed? Well, yeah, I mean, the most immediate effect is that uh, there were approximately 7,000 or so adults being cited for simple marijuana possession each year. And that number is now zero. Um, You know, and then, of course, there were probably people, as you alluded to, people that were perhaps stopped for or, you know, or searched because of a marijuana smell or related, uh, you know, incident. Um, so, you know, marijuana is now legal for adults 21 and older to possess. So those arrests and, and those citations have ended. We've also seen a reported reduction in the number of marijuana related uh, arrests for larger offenses, things like, like cultivation and distribution. Those have also dropped uh, as well significantly. Uh, we are still seeing some disproportionate impact in, in law enforcement uh, when it comes to things like public consumption, I mean, the the thing is, is that you know marijuana laws were disproportionately enforced against communities of color, against uh, lower income communities. That was not unique to marijuana. It was not because of marijuana. It was because of law enforcement practices, and those law enforcement practices still exist. And so, because it's still illegal to consume in public we do still see more people of color, uh, at least per capita, uh, you know, being arrested or, or excuse me, issued a citation because law enforcement tends to stop more people of color, cite more people of color, spend more time in communities where there are more people of color. Uh, so, you know, it's really a symptom of the broader, you know, discrimination and, and, and societal issues than the problem itself. It's, it's a symptom of this. And fortunately, we've managed to address it when it comes to things like possession, but it is still a factor when it comes to things like public consumption. Yeah. Hey, uh, what about people who are on probation or parole? Do they still get revoked over it? Uh, yeah, because marijuana is still illegal under federal law. And I mean, when it comes to things like parole, and in some cases, I believe probation, uh, you know, that's something where someone can be pro- prohibited from consuming alcohol. So, you know, it's, it's not so pot's still definitely included a hundred percent of the time, just like before. Yeah, You can't violate a federal law when you're on parole. Um, so, you know, and again, um, I think that it certainly would be unfair if it's, uh, you know, if it was being treated differently than alcohol, but if the laws that we have say that when you're on parole, a condition can be that you don't consume alcohol, then uh, certainly a condition could be that you, you don't consume cannabis. But uh, yeah, these are the types of things, you know, those, those things like employment issues, uh, public benefits, um, things like that are going to need to catch up, and they are culturally. Um, but uh, that's going to take some time because obviously marijuana has been illegal a long time and we've built all sorts of structures societal structures around and and legal structures around it being illegal and now we're starting to see that that change Mm -hmm. and now you know what i'm sorry i think i got us you know off track when we were talking about texas there for a minute i went back to colorado but uh in your efforts here in texas have you focused on the safer than alcohol angle because it sounds like that's the one that's worked the best for you so far um, you know, MPP is not is not currently focused on Texas. Texas is uh, a state that the legislature only convenes every other year. This is an off year. Uh, MPP was involved there last year, and, and, and its efforts were largely focused on a decriminalization measure and medical. And so they're less conducive to that safer argument around alcohol. But it is certainly something that was mentioned. You know, we had a TV ad featuring a former law enforcement official uh, that aired in Texas in several cities. And it's, you know, in it, he mentioned that, you know, this is a substance less harmful than alcohol and not what, you know, he would, he dealt with far more people who were drunk than people using marijuana during his time as a cop. Um, So we certainly did use that. That's good. Well, I hope somebody will take it up um, because, you know, I could see, and especially from all the coverage here, you know, people just Google to vert and drug duel. 
And you can see what a great splash that made. And I forget which article it was that I read. You know, I reread a few here. But the one that I read before, I couldn't really find. But they really talked about how profound it was in terms of changing the entire field the game was being played on, basically. Changing the entire context of the conversation and the debate. And then you just won it that easily because, I mean, obviously you're right in the first place. So that made it easier. But you took it off the terms that, as you were saying, hadn't been successful, like saying that the war on pot is worse than pot or whatever. For whatever reason, that never impressed anyone. So find something else. I guess, you know what, I want to ask you this. What advice do you have to people in the anti-war movement to change, maybe if you have any ideas, to kind of change the context uh, I don't in know. which we debate the, the endless I mean, terror war? Uh, I, I honestly, I, I haven't really put that much thought into it on this level so i wouldn't uh, you know all right well come up with something right now you're yeah. the brilliant genius come on it's on you no yeah, just... well, you know we're always you know my firm's always for hire so give us a yeah. call there you go all right well anyway uh it's a great example to follow there that you've set so i uh, really appreciate your time on the show talking about that too and and congratulations on your great success thank you so much for having me I really appreciate it all right you guys that is mason Tavert. And he is at the Marijuana Policy Project, which I guess is MarijuanaPolicyProject.org or MPP.org. You guys can find it. All right, y'all. Thanks. Find me at LibertarianInstitute.org, at ScottHorton.org, AntiWar.com, and Reddit.com slash Scott Horton Show. Oh, yeah. And read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan at Fool's Errand.us.